going to hear from a man who rarely speaks out, don't hear from him much publicly, the leader of Hamas, Khalid Bashal. He sat down for an exclusive interview with CNN's Nick Robertson, and Nick is joining us now live. Nick, you had a wide-ranging interview with Khalid Bashal. Did he leave any opening for a potential ceasefire with Israel? He left a very big opening for at least a humanitarian truce. He said that's definitely on the table. And he says, as far as Hamas is concerned, yes, they are open for a lasting ceasefire. But he has demands. He says that uh, the, the demands are that uh, the blockade around Gaza must be lifted. I asked him specifically, what did he mean about that? He wants the borders open. He wants the international airport there working. He wants the sea, access to the sea, a port for Gaza. He wants them to be able to live as any other, as any other other people in the world. Those were his terms for what he wants. I asked him if he was willing to stop the rocket firing, to stop the tunnel building. All of these, he said, are possible. The rocket firing can be stopped, he said, if we can get the deal that we want from Israel. I asked him if he thought that uh, Hamas was winning. He said that their victory is their steadfastness so far, even though he knows they're facing a much greater military opposition. Um, and he said that in his belief that the people of Gaza um, stand behind Hamas's political leadership and their military fighters on the ground because they want change. What is different compared to 2008, 2009 conflict, 2012 conflict along similar lines? I asked him that question. He told me as well that, uh, that this was different because um, they're not going to settle the Palestinian people, he said, are not going to settle for a deal less than this uh, unrestricted, if you will, opening of the borders of Gaza. But I asked him also at the very beginning is, does he, the political leader of Hamas, all that way uh, distant in Qatar, really have influence over the military men on the battlefield? This is how the interview began. Hamas, Hamasia. Hamas is an institutional movement. It has a respected leadership. All the members of Hamas, whether in the political or armed wing, are disciplined. The Israelis, the Egyptians, and the U.S. administration know this. Otherwise, John Kerry would not have intervened. President Obama said it is irresponsible of Hamas to fire their rockets from civilian neighborhoods. That's what you're doing. Why do you do it when you know the civilians are going to die? Look at the results. How many Israeli civilians did our rockets kill? Israel knows the number. Meanwhile, how many Palestinian civilians has Israel killed? Up until now, it killed 1,700 people, while we killed, by Israel's own admission, 63 soldiers. We kill soldiers, combatants, while they kill civilians. But because, you're, but because, because you're firing your rockets from civilian neighborhoods, that's where you're firing your rockets from. Your rockets are fired, Israel says, indiscriminately to civilian areas, Tel Aviv, Jerusalem. President Obama says you're firing your rockets from civilian neighborhoods, and you know what that means, that you will have high civilian casualties. Critics are saying that the only reason that you're doing this is to that you get the international outpouring of international sympathy because of the high civilian casualties. It is unfortunate that the U.S. administration and President Obama have adopted the Israeli narrative, which is a lie. Hamas sacrifices itself for its people and does not use its people as human shields to protect its soldiers. These are lies, and Hamas does not seek international sympathy through its own victims. But what is very clear here, Wolf, in the discussions that I had uh, before and after the cameras were rolling, is that certainly this high civilian death toll, Hamas believes, is bringing an internationalization to the current situation that they believe should work in their favor, that the international community also wants to get a deal between Hamas and Israel that will last and endure and, uh, and end the uh, high death toll at the moment. So there certainly is a belief from Hamas that this is, if you will, cynically working in this favor, this high civilian death toll, although quite clearly um, Halid Michal says we're not doing this to create a high civilian death toll. I also asked him about the issue of weapons being stored in schools, rockets and such like being scored, uh, stored in schools. He said, and this is what Halid Michal said, he said that is absolutely not true. We do not do that. Uh, look, he said 60 mosques and schools have been destroyed across Gaza. He said, do you think Hamas controls all those buildings and has weapons there? He said he invited 
invites international monitors to come into Gaza. However unrealistic this may sound, he invites international monitors to come to Gaza to see that they're not doing that, Wolf. You know, Nick, uh, yeah, Khalid Michel used to be based in Damascus, Syria, until that civil war really erupted. Now he's in Doha, Qatar. The Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, constantly ridicules him, saying he's living in five-star hotels in Doha, Qatar, while his people are suffering in Gaza. What does he say about that? Why isn't he in Gaza? Yeah, I mean, he's, his view, and it's been this way for a long time. I mean, we have to remember, of course, Halid Michal, when he was in uh, Jordan, living in Jordan, uh, Israeli secret service agents tried to kill him, poison him. It took um, King Hussein of Jordan at the time to appeal to the Israelis to get the antidote to, uh, to allow him to live. He doesn't feel safe going back to uh, Gaza again to live. That's why he was in Damascus when the conflict began there. He decided it wasn't safe. Qatar gave him a home. His logic is, is that he is safer and as a political leader is just as connected with his people on the ground as if he were there. He feels safer clearly in Qatar. He feels certainly safer there today than he does when he was living in Damascus as well. I met him a and interviewed him a couple of times in Damascus over the recent years as well. But he insists 2008, 2009, 2012, they went through this same scenario, a conflict in Gaza, the accusations that he, Halid Mashal, was not really fully political rep politically representative of the feeling on the ground in Gaza. He says, look, the leadership has endured. Strategically, Wolf, uh, whatever gap there is and difficulties in communications, strategically, he, Halid Michal, and, and the leadership on the ground there in Gaza are headed in the same broad direction. And it certainly appears that they're willing to let one horse lead at one moment, one horse lead at the other, but essentially they're pulling in the same direction. And their strategy very clearly is to, is to show that there isn't any gap between the military, between the political leadership. That's clearly his message. And the reality we've seen over recent years, recent conflicts there, Wolf, is it does seem to endure. Nick Robertson bringing us an exclusive interview with the Hamas uh, political leader, Khaled Michel. Nick, thanks very much.